طيب بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So this is the second part in the series of three or four lectures, inshallah. We'll be talking about the Isra and the Mi'raj, the miraculous night's journey of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he was taken in one night from Mecca, the Kaaba, to Masjid al-Aqsa. And then from the Masjid al-Aqsa, he was taken to Bayt al-Maqdis. From there, he was taken up to the heavens and back down again and back to Mecca again in one night. And as we talked about last week, this was quite possibly. This is black BMW. Black BMW. A black BMW is triple parked. Can it please be moved? Uh, and as scholars of Islam have mentioned that quite possibly this was the greatest miracle given to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after the miracle of the Quran. So last week we had got to the point where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has prayed in Bayt al-Maqdis, leading all the Prophets in prayer. And we mentioned that Jibreel then took hold of his hand and guided him upwards, ascending to the heavens. The Barak at this point is still tethered to Bayt al-Maqdis. So the Barak's journey has stopped. Here Jibreel himself is taking the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, upwards towards the heavens. And when they arrived at the lowest celestial heaven, Jibreel knocked on one of his gates and asked the guardian of that heaven to open the gate so that they could enter. And the guardian asked, who is this? And he replied, it's Jibreel. And then the guardian asked, do you have anybody with you? And he replied, yes, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the guardian asked, has he been sent for? Has he been commissioned? Meaning, has he been invited for this night's journey? Is it, is it has a time come for him to make this night's nice journey? And Jibreel said yes. And then the guardian of the heaven said, Marhaban bihi, wa la ni'mal ja'a. Welcome to him. What an excellent visitor we have today. What a great visitor we have today. And all the inhabitants of the heavens rejoiced at the coming of the Messenger or the visit of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Showing again how excited they were and the status of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That all the inhabitants, meaning all the angels, rejoice at the arrival of Allah's Messenger Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. And then the gate is opened, and they ascend and enter the first heaven. Jibreel and Prophet Muhammad Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. And there they see a man, and to his right is a group of people. And when he looks at them, he laughs. And to his left is another group of people. But when he looks at these, he cries. He is sad. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa asked Jibreel, who is this? Who is this man? And Jibreel replied, this is Adam alayhi islam. The first prophet, the first of creation, the first human being created. Who is this? It shows us that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa didn't know who he was. He didn't recognize him. It shows us that Unlike what some people claim, Allah's Messenger didn't know everything. Allah's Messenger was not Ali al he was not the knower of the unseen. He only knew what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught him. That's all he knew. And that's a great deal of knowledge, but that's the extent of what he knew. So he didn't know who Adam was until Jibreel said, this is Adam. Does this distract from the status of the Messenger of Allah alayhi by saying he doesn't know everything? Of course not. He knows what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has, has taught him and that's the extent of what he knows. And that knowledge is great. That knowledge is vast that he's been given. But he is not the knower of the unseen. He is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he asks Jibreel, who is this? And Jibreel replied, this is your father Adam. The groups to his right and to his left are his children, his descendants, meaning all of us, all of mankind. All of mankind from the, time, from the time of Adam to the last day is there. And amongst them would be us as well. And the people to his right, the Ashab al Yameen, are the people of paradise. They are the people who will go to paradise. And when he looks at them, he is happy. He smiles and he laughs. And the people to his left are the people of hellfire. 
And when he looks at them, he is sad and he cries. <coughs> and then Jibreel said, give him your salam. So the Prophet وسلم, gave him his salam and Adam replied and then said, Marhaban bil ibn salih wa nabi salih. Welcome to the righteous prophet, my righteous son. Welcome to the righteous prophet, my righteous son. I want to stop here for a bit and consider this narration. There's a great lesson for us to learn in this narration from our, about what the Prophet saw with Adam Islam. And the lesson we learn, one of the great lessons we learn here, is that Adam is genuinely concerned, genuinely concerned about his descendants. He cares about his children. So when he sees the people of the right, he is happy because of his care and concern and solicitude for his children and his descendants, he is genuinely happy that these are people who will enter paradise. But when he looks at the people on the left, he doesn't just dismiss them and say, dirty kuffar, dirty filthy disbelievers. He's sad. He genuinely feels for the fact that these people are his sons, his children. He genuinely feels hurt and sorrow and pain at the fact that they are people of hellfire. They chose this path and ended up in people of hellfire. And this was the way of the prophets, all of them. And this is the way of the dirty, the believer. We hate disbelief. We hate kufr. We hate shirk. But we have to have a genuine concern for human beings. All of humanity, we have a genuine, real concern for them. We want the best for them. And the best for them is Islam, in this life and the next life. So just as the prophets had genuine concern for them, we believers should also have genuine concern for the people we are calling to Islam, for the people around us. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, himself was somebody who would worry constantly about his people. And he was aggrieved at their rejection of him. Not because they were rejecting him, but because they were rejecting the truth and therefore sealing their fate. And he wanted the best for them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually says about him, his, his condition and his state, But you are going to worry yourself to death over them because they are not believing in this message. Allah himself is saying, this is how the messenger of Allah was. He's worrying himself to death about these people. He's so concerned about these people. He's so worried about these people. He's worried about them to, almost to death. And because he was so worried about them, Allah counseled him and said, don't go to such lengths in sorrow. Don't go to such extremes in sorrow. Do not waste your soul away with regret for them, Allah says to him. Do not waste your soul away with regret for them. Allah knows exactly what they do. So show concern, be solicitous of them, be sincere in your call towards them, but don't go to the extreme where you're going to waste your soul away. Worry yourself to death over these people. That's with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many other scholars, when they mentioned the greeting of Adam to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Welcome to the righteous Prophet, my righteous son. And then he made dua for his good, for goodness for him. They said, we learn some manners here. And one of the manners we learn is that it's recommended to welcome guests with good words, with nice words. When a guest comes to us, we welcome him with good, happy words. Marhaban, welcome. And likewise, this narration shows us that it's permissible to mention good things about a person to his face, provided there's no fear that that person will become big-headed as a result, become arrogant or conceited as a result or well, he doesn't fall into fitna as a result. And of course, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will not become big-headed as a result of hearing the words of praise from his father, Adam alayhi salam. So, the main point I want to, for us to take away from here is that we learn from this narration that Adam was sincerely concerned for his people. And all the prophets were sincerely concerned for his people. And our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sincerely concerned and solicitous about his people. And likewise, we too should be people who are concerned about those around us, the Muslim and the non-Muslim.
Now, each of the heavens they go up to, they go up to, through seven heavens. Each of the guardians of the heavens ask the same questions. Who is this Jibreel? Who is with you, Muhammad? Has he been sent for? Yes. All these, que these questions are asked in each of the heavens. I'm not going to repeat them again. But just be aware that every heaven they ascend to, this question will be asked them as well. So they ascend to the second heaven. And upon entering the second heaven, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw the two maternal cousins, Isa ibn Maryam and Yahya ibn Zakariya alayhi wa sallam. And Isa, the Prophet Muhammad described as being a young, slender man, light-skinned, curly-haired, keen-eyed, and of medium build, looking as if he had just come out of a bath. And then the Messenger of Allah said he resembled Urwa ibn Mas'ud, who is one of the companions. Again, he doesn't know who they are. He asks Jibreel who they are. Jibreel introduces him. And then Jibreel asks him, send your give your salam to them. He does so, and they reply. And they also add, Marhab bil Akhi Salih wa Nabiya Salih. Welcome to the righteous prophet, our righteous brother. Adam said our righteous son, because obviously he's the father. They are saying our righteous brother. And then they also make dua for goodness for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the third heaven, he ascends up again alayhi salatu wasalam. He met Yusuf alayhi salam. And he said, Utiya Yusuf shatr al husn That Yusuf had been given half of all worldly beauty. All worldly beauty, half of it was given to Yusuf alayhi salam. Again, the Prophet asked who he was. Again, Jibreel introduces him. And the same greeting happens. And there's an interesting narration here from Aisha radiallahu anha that I want to, again, that I want us to think about. She said, with Yusuf, we know that Zuleika, who is Zuleika? Was it the woman that tried to tempt him? The woman who tried to tempt him. And when she invited the whole guests around them, when they saw Yusuf, they cut their hands, right, out of, out of, uh, out of you know, awe at the beauty of Yusuf alayhi salam. Aisha radiallahu anha said, that if these companions of Zulaika had seen the face of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they would have cut their hearts instead of their hands. They would have cut their hearts instead of their hands. Why? Because the companions of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they looked at the Messenger of Allah through the lens of Iman, through the lens of faith. And they believed him, and he was, to be the most beautiful person ever. Beauty in terms of external beauty, beauty in terms of internal beauty as well. His morals, his manners were sublime, his character was sublime, his person was sublime. This is why Al-Bara ibn Azib, he said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was the most handsome of people, with the best of builds. And then he said, Lam ara qablahu wa la ba'lahu mithlahu. And then after this, he can't describe him anymore. He's unable to put in words how the Messenger of Allah truly was. So he said, I've never seen anybody before him or after him who was like him. Beauty is of a number of types, or two types if you like. One is a type of beauty that astonishes you immediately. You see it and you think, wow. And this was the beauty of Yusuf alayhi salam. And then you get a second type of beauty. And that's a beauty that takes time to settle. And it grows on you after reflecting and association. And this is the beauty of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ali radiallahu anhu said, Man ra'ahu badihatan hadahu. That whoever saw Allah's Messenger of a sudden, he would be awestruck. Woman khalatahu ma'rifatan ahabbahu. But whoever reflected upon him, whoever associated with him, whoever got to know him truly would love him. Yaqulu na'ituhu. And a person who tried to describe him would end up just saying, Lam ara qablahu wa la ba'dahu mithlahu. I've never seen anybody before him or after him who was like him. They were unable to describe the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as he truly, as truly behoves him alayhi salatu wa sallam. So beauty is of two types. One, the type of beauty given to Yusuf alayhi salam. The second, the type of beauty given to the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wa sallam. One that grows on you after reflection and association. When you start realizing, realizing just how great this person is you, in whose company you are. He ascends again to the fourth heaven. 
And here he sees Idris alayhi salam. And again, the same discussion happens. Who is he? This is Idris. Gives him the salam. And then Idris says, Welcome to the righteous prophet and my righteous brother. And prayed for his well being. And then a messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, About him, Allah says, That we have raised him to a high position. And this, this was the fourth, his high position is him in the fourth heaven. And then a very interesting incident happens at this fourth heaven, which most books that talk about Isra and Miraj don't discuss. But it's an authentic narration. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Laylata utriya bi marautu ala jibreel fil malai al-a'la kal hils al-bali min khashat allahi azza wa jal. And in one narration, in a narration, I mentioned that in the fourth heaven, I pass by the heavenly company. This is the, the company of the greatest angels. And I saw Jibreel there, like a worn out camel's cloth, like a worn out saddle's cloth from the fear of his Lord. He's like a worn out cloth of a saddle from the fear of his Lord. Firstly, what's strange about this narration? Worn out cloth. No. no. He's with Jibreel already. Jibreel is accompanying him. And yet in the fourth heaven he sees Jibreel again in the company of the exalted angels. And this shows us that again the laws of nature as we know them no longer apply to this journey. The whole journey from beginning to end, the laws of nature as we know them don't apply to this journey. Jibreel is accompanying him, yet at the same time he sees Jibreel in this, this, in, in the, in this the gathering of the angels, the highest angels. And he says his, his appearance is like a worn out saddle cloth, a cloth of a saddle from the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a similitude, an example that's been given about how his fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has humbled him. How his fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made him a person of, has increased his uh, taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how his not a fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not made him arrogant or somebody who lords over other people. And in one narration, and this is again a very important narration, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a narration of Bazaar, فَأَرَفْتُ فَضْلَ عِلْمِهِ بِاللَّهِ That I realized then how superior and how true his knowledge of Allah was. I realized then how superior and how true his knowledge of Allah was. Because the fruit of knowledge, the fruit of learning about Islam, the fruit of having Iman and learning more about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is exactly we end up in this state. We are humbled by the greatness of our Lord Most High. We are humbled by the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are humbled by the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why the Salaf used to say, the great scholars of the past, that knowledge without these fruits, knowledge without the fruit of action, and knowledge without the fruit of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like a tree that bears no fruit. It's like a tree that bears no fruit. And the best knowledge is that which benefits. And Allah only causes knowledge to benefit a person when he acts upon that knowledge, once having learnt it. And he does not cause it to benefit the person that leaves it after having learnt it. Knowledge that we have in Islam, knowledge that we learn that we don't act upon, is actually an argument against us on the last day. It's actually an evidence against us on the last day. Everything we learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything we learn about our religion, we have to implement. We have to internalize it. Make, it, make us people who are fearful of our Lord Most High, who have the conscious, consciousness of our Lord Most High. So this is an important lesson for us to take away here, that Jibreel, the greatest of all angels, the greatest of all angels, is like a worn out cloth of a saddle because of his fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the knowledge he has of Allah is true and sincere and superior. In the fifth heaven, he meets Harun alayhi salam. Welcome to the righteous prophet and my righteous brother and he made dua for him again. <coughs> in all of these pro prophets at his meeting, the common trend, of the common statement of all of them 
is that they are welcoming him, they're happy to meet him, and they are making dua for him. They love him, alayhi salatu was salam. Because all the prophets are one brotherhood. Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al anbiya wa ikhwatun li alat, ummahatum shatta wa deenuhum wahid. That the prophets are all paternal brothers. Their mothers, mothers may be different, but their religion, religion is one and the same. Their religion is one and the same. The prophets are one brotherhood, and they love each other as brothers. And the ummas of the prophets are one brotherhood, and they love each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We, as the followers of the messengers, alayhi salatu wasalam, are one ummah. Wa inna hadihi ummatukum, ummatum wahida. This nation of yours is just one nation. Wa ana rabbukum fa'adum. And I am your Lord, so worship me. One nation, one ummah, one group of people who are following Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa loving each other, supporting each other, aiding each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the sake of the truth. In the sixth heaven, he meets Musa alayhi salam. And he describes Musa as a tall, imposing, heavily muscled man with a head of long hair coming down to his ears and he had a brown complexion. He looked like a person from the tribe of Shanu'a, a tribe that was known at that time. We don't know what they looked like, but obviously they were big, strong guys. The Prophet وسلم, extended a salam to him. And Musa welcomed him, saying, Welcome to the righteous Prophet and my righteous brother. And again, made dua for his well being. But when the Messenger of Allah passed by him, Musa wept. Musa cried. And a voice called out, why are you crying? And Musa gave the explanation. And part of his explanation, the first half is actually the reason why he's crying. The second half of the explanation is the reason why he's crying. The first half, he talks about his admiration of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his ghibta, what they call admiration. Where he sees the qualities and the blessings being bestowed upon the Messenger Alayhi bestowed upon the Messenger Alayhi he sees his status and he wishes that he was given something similar without wanting it to go away from the Messenger Alayhi He is happy that the Messenger of Allah has got this status and he wants something similar, he wanted something similar as well. So he says, Lam adunna ahadan yurfa alayya. I didn't think anybody would have a status above mine. But the Messenger of Allah, he found out has a status above him. And he goes, Banu Israel, anni akramul khalki ala Allah. The Banu Israel, my people, think that I am the most noble person of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa hada akramu ala Allah minni. But this man is more dearer to, or is dearer to Allah than I am. This man holds a higher status with Allah than I do. وَلَوْ كَانَ هَذَا وَحْدَهُ هَانَ عَلَيَّ And if this alone was enough, if this, if this was the only fact, that would be easy for me to bear. وَلَكِنْ مَعَهُ أُمَّتُهُ وَهُمْ أَفْضُلُ الْأُمَمْ إِنْدَ اللَّهِ But he has a whole nation with him. And that nation is the most honoured of all nations. Us, the Muslims. That nation is the most honoured of all nations. This is now why he cries. Because he says, And this servant has been sent, this young man has been sent after me. That more of his nation will enter paradise than mine. He's crying, again we have to put this in proper context, he's crying out of concern for his nation. <coughs> he's crying out of concern for his nation. When he thinks about the reaction his nation had towards him, how they were so arrogant, how they were so tyrannical, how they were so disobedient, how they were so far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He thinks about that and compares it to the nation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and how his ummah, generally speaking, are better and more recipient, more uh, uh, likely to accept the truth of Islam. When he compares the two and he sees how far away his nation was from the truth and in their rejection and, ob and, and uh, obduration, then he cries out of concern for his ummah alayhi salam. Like Adam crying for his people, Musa is crying for his people when he compares them to the nation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Again, that shows us 
brothers and sisters, that this nation has truly been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The blessings are many, and we can give many lectures about how Allah has blessed this nation, how Allah has uh, shown honor to this nation, how Allah has given ease to this nation. And then we have, once we realize this, we have a duty. We have a duty to live up to that standard. <coughs> we have a duty to follow the Messenger of Allah. <coughs> we have a duty to be the best of the best. We have a duty to be the best of the best. After all these blessings that Allah has given us as the Ummah of Muhammad we have to uh, respond to those blessings by acknowledging them and by worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being servants of Allah truly in this life. We have a great duty and a great responsibility as a result. In the seventh heaven, he sees Ibrahim, Khalil al-Rahman, the beloved of al-Rahman. And he describes him an old, awe-inspiring man, resembling most the Prophet Muhammad himself So much so that the Messenger of Allah said, every limb I looked at of, the, of Ibrahim, that limb reminded me of my own limb. That's how much resemblance was between Ibrahim and the Messenger And he was reclining with his back against Al-Bayt Al-Ma'mur, a house, a Kaaba. The Kaaba of the heavens. And again, the Messenger of Allah asked Jibreel, What is this house? He doesn't know what this house is. It's a house that is a copy of the Kaaba on earth. And Ibrahim is sitting with his back against, reclining against, leaning against the, the wall of the Kaaba, the Bayt al Ma'mur. And Jibreel replied, Had al Bayt al Ma'mur. This is al Bayt al Ma'mur. يُسَلِّي فِيهِ كُلَّ يَوْمٍ سَبَعُونَ أَلْفْ مَلَكٍ Every day 70,000 angels enter to pray. إِذَا خَرَجُوا لَمْ يَعُودُوا إِلَيْهِ آخِرَ مَا عَلَيْهِمْ And when they leave, these same angels never visit again. Every day 70,000 angels come to this place. They make their tawaf. They worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the end of the day they leave. They never visit again. 70,000 different angels every single day. So in a week, 490,000 angels visit. In a month, 2,100,000 angels visit. In a year, 25,200,000 angels visit. That's just one year. Let alone from the time of creation to the, to the end of days. None knows the forces, the armies of your Lord, truly can estimate the armies of your Lord, except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This shows us, this Bayt al-Ma'mur, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about it. <coughs> he said about it that it is directly above the Kaaba on this earth. And were it to fall, it would fall directly on the Kaaba on this earth. It's directly above it <coughs> and it's a, it is a copy of the Kaaba on this earth. And some of the scholars when they talk, talked about this narration, Imam Nawi and others, they said it shows us the permissibility of reclining against the Kaaba putting our back against the Kaaba. It shows us the permissibility of reclining in direction of the Qibla. It shows us the permissibility of turning one's back to the Qibla as well. There's a tradition amongst Asian communities specifically, they think it's disrespectful to turn your back towards the Qibla, like I, like I have here, yeah, have my back towards the Qibla. This narration, they said Ibrahim has got his back to the Bayt al yeah, the, He's got his back to him, he shows the permissibility of showing, turning one's back towards the Qibla and reclining against the Kaaba as well. So the Messenger of Allah then asked, who is this man? This man that resembles me so much. And Jibreel introduced him saying, this is your father Ibrahim, again your father. Greet him with a salam. So the Messenger of Allah gave him salam and Ibrahim replied and said, well, marhaban bil ibn salih wa nabi salih. Welcome to my righteous son, the righteous prophet. So in the seventh heaven where the, the ascension is ending, we have the same statement being said as, as we started with Adam. Welcome to our righteous son, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu <coughs> And then he gave him advice to the Messenger of Allah. He said, Ya Muhammad, aqri' ummataka minni salam. O oh Muhammad, send my salam to your ummah. Send my salam to your ummah. Again, showing the great states of the, of the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That Ibrahim is sending salam not just to the Prophet Muhammad, 
but the whole Ummah Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam as well. وَأَخْبِرْهُمْ أَنَّ الْجَنَّةَ طَيِّبَةُ الطُرْبَةَ عَذْبَةُ الْمَانَ And tell them that paradise is pure, wholesome earth, soil, and its water is sweet. وَأَنَّ هَقِيعًا And its unplanted land. Its unplanted land. وَأَنَّ ذِرَاسَهَا سُبْحَانَ اللَّهُ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهُ وَلَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ And the seedlings for this land are the statements, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, allahu akbar. And in another narration it's mentioned, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. These statements, each time we say them, a seed is planted in paradise and the tree grows, or a, 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 a vegetation grows as a result of that statement. And then Ibrahim said, alayhi salatu wasalam, order them to plant many seeds. Enjoin them to plant many seeds. <coughs> what does this mean? What do you think this means? Make lots of dhikr. Sorry? Make lots, of make lots of dhikr. Order them to make lots of dhikr. Every single statement we say of these five statements, a seed is grown there. And it belongs to us in paradise by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah, la ilaha illa, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illa Allah, Allahu Akbar, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. And these are from amongst the most beloved statements to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Allah's Messenger said to us. Ahabbu al-Kalami illallahi azza wa jal arba. There are four statements that are most beloved to Allah, our Lord Most High. La ilaha illallah. Allahu Akbar. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. And He said, Shall I guide you to a statement that is a treasure from amongst the treasures of paradise? Shall I tell you a statement that is a treasure from amongst the treasures of paradise? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Say these frequently. So, this is the journey through the seven heavens. Who can tell us the prophets he meets at each of these heavens in order? Adam alayhi salam, the second was Isa and Yahya, the third was Yusuf, the fourth was Harun, you know, no, the fifth was Harun, the sixth was Musa, the seventh was Ibrahim. Exactly. Somebody else? Who else can try? Go on, bro. Did you have your hand up? No. no? Okay. <laughs> Somebody else? The prophets to the seven heavens. Yeah, go on. Uh, the first was Adam, the second was uh, Isa and Yahya, the third was Yus Yusuf, fourth was Idris, fifth was uh, Harun, Harun, sixth was Musa, Musa, seventh was Ibrahim. Ibrahim good. The last point I want to mention before we stop today is that <coughs> the scholars have actually mentioned why is it that he, meant he met these prophets out of all the prophets? What are the possible reasons why he met out of all the prophets he met these particular ones in the heavens? And they said that actually if you look at the lives, the biographies of these prophets, they all have a resemblance to the life of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, and to what will happen to the Messenger of Allah during his lifetime as well. So Adam alayhi salam is expelled from the holiest of places, Tawr Jannah. But he shall return in the, uh, in the last day. Likewise, the Prophet Muhammad was expelled from the holiest of places on this earth, Mecca. But he will return. He will return. Isa and Yahya chronologically the closest to the Prophet Their own people tried to kill them. They did kill Yahya, they failed in killing Isa So too will the people of Muhammad وسلم, try to kill a messenger وسلم, but they will not succeed. Yeah. Yusuf, his own blood brothers harmed him, turned against him. But in the end he rose victorious and his brothers repented and accepted his faith. So too will the Quraysh, the tribe of the Messenger of Allah salam, turn against him. But in the end, he will rise victorious and his, and his tribe will come accept Islam. And this is exactly what happened in the fact of Mecca, the conquest of Mecca. That he came, he entered Mecca. And he was in such a humble state that they said that his head was so low, it was on the level on par of the animal he was riding. And he said when he entered Mecca the same words that Yusuf said to his brothers. 
La tafriba alaykum al yawm. There's no blame, no uh, uh, recom uh, rec recompense, or no retaliation against you today. And the Quraysh will accept the Islam as well. Idris gave him an exalted place. The Prophet وسلم, has been given the highest of places, the Maqam Mahmud, the highest of stations. Harun was despised by his people, then they accepted him. Likewise, the Messenger of Allah was despised by his people, then they accepted him. Musa, out of all the Prophets, Musa is the most experienced, we'll learn about this next week, inshallah. Musa is the one who has the most experience about leading a large ummah. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, will also lead a large ummah. And we'll see how Musa's experience guides the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa next week. And it was to Musa that Messenger of Allah would refer to many times in his life. Whenever he was harmed, whenever he was tortured, he kept on saying, لَقَدْ أُوذِيَ مُوسَى بِأَكْثَرَ مِنْ هَذَا فَصَبْرُ Musa was harmed more than this, but he was patient. So he would remind himself about the life of Musa alayhi over and over again. In fact, Musa is the most talked about prophet in the Quran. And likewise, and finally, Ibrahim. He is the Khalil, the beloved of Ar-Rahman, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But just as Ibrahim is the beloved, so too is Muhammad the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna Allah ittakhadhani khalilan, kama ittakhadha Ibrahim khalilan. That Allah has taken me as a Khalil, as a dear, beloved friend, just as he took Ibrahim as a dear, beloved friend. And inshallah, we'll stop there and we'll continue next week. Subhanakallah, uh, wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa anta, astaghfiruka wa atubi ilayk.